Chapter 10 of Our Little English Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Francis Brown. www.francislv.wordpress.com. Our Little English Cousin by Blanche McManus. Chapter 10 The Lord Mayor's Show. One of the great events in life of an English child is to be able to go to London to the Lord Mayor's Show, which takes place every year on the 9th of November. Thousands of families from all over the country come into London for that day and bring the young folks. Early in the morning of the great day, the Howard and Stamford families had taken up their position at two of the big windows of a hotel, from which a good view of the parade could be had. Eleanor and Clarence had come up with the Howards, so you can fancy what a merry party it was. All of the children but Edith had seen it before, but they were just as eager as if it were a brand new sight. As for Edith, she kept her little nose glued to the window pane and hardly winked her eyes for fear she might miss something. The Lord Mayor's show, like most customs in England, is of very ancient origin. It has always been considered a great honor to be the Lord Mayor of London and live in the mansion house, as his home is called. All children remember the story of Dick Whittington and his cat, and how he heard the bells of London, which said to him that he would become Lord Mayor of London. And I believe it is a true story, too. Not about the bells really talking to him, perhaps, but about the little country boy who struggled on and did become the great Lord Mayor. The Lord Mayor's rule only extends over what is called the city, which is now only a small part of big London. Long ago, when the office was first created, what is now the city was all there was of London. It was enclosed at that time by walls. Well, times have changed. London has spread miles away on every side from the city, but the Lord Mayor of London still holds almost an absolute sway over his part of London. Many of the old laws still exist, such as the king cannot go into the city without the permission of the Lord Mayor, who must meet him at the city boundary and present a sword, which the king touches and then he can pass in. Of course, this is only a form now, but it is still a picturesque ceremony which usually takes place at Temple Bar on the Strand. Every year, a new Lord Mayor is chosen, and the show, which is a procession that passes through the principal streets, is to celebrate his incoming. Our little folks were becoming impatient, though it was amusing to watch the vast crowd move hither and thither by the good-natured policemen. Companies of strolling minstrels amused the people, singing songs and cracking jokes, while the vendors of the funny colored programs did a large business. I do believe they're coming at last. These words of Adelaide's brought every head as far out of the windows as possible. Yes, there were the gorgeous coaches of the aldermen, but nothing to compare to the one which followed the great gilded coach of the Lord Mayor himself, with a sword of state sticking out of the window, because it is too big for the carriage. You have never seen, nor will ever see, anything more splendid than the coachman to the Lord Mayor. We have to talk about him first, because he is seen first. He is a tremendous big fellow, in plush red knee breeches, with a coat all gold, bright, and lace. White silk stockings cover his portly calves, and his shoes sparkle with big buckles. A three-cornered hat sits pompously on his big powdered wig, and there is a bouquet in his coat, beside which a cabbage would look small. Standing behind the carriage are two footmen, only a trifle less magnificent. The coachman so catches the young people's eye, they scarcely see the Lord Mayor inside the gold coach. But he too is granted his fine robe of velvet and fur, and a magnificent golden chain about his neck. Then comes the various guilds or societies of the City of London, the Guild of Clockmakers, the Guild of the Goldsmiths, the Guild of Tanners, and many others. Then come soldiers and bands of music, and floats or wagons on which are symbolic designs or tableau. The people cheer, and our little folks clap their hands, and nothing in the world could be so grand. As Adelaide's mother once said to Edith, You have only yet seen a very small bit of London. There is, indeed, much more to be seen in this great old city, and in England, for even if it is a very small country, it holds a great deal. But we must for the present bid our little English cousin good-bye, and give some other little cousin a chance. End of chapter 10 Recording by Francis Brown www.francis.com
lv.librivox.com. End of Our Little English Cousin by Blanche McManus.